Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video where today I'm going to be talking about the 1999 London nail bombing attacks in which a neo-Nazi targeted areas known for minorities aiming to cause as much harm as possible. Direct attacks on the black, Bangladeshi and gay communities of London. As you probably know, June is Pride Month and I love to talk about cases and stories involving the LGBTQ plus community on my channel. I love a good social justice case. I think it's important to tell the stories and learn the history of the LGBT community, learn why we've come as far as we have. Today there's less discrimination, less blatant hate than there was 20, 30, even 40 years ago, but there's still a long way to go. If you're paying attention, you may have seen that Trump passed a ruling in the USA this month, Pride Month, and on the fourth anniversary of the Pulse Massacre that removed protections for transgender Americans against sex discrimination in healthcare. Essentially meaning that doctors, healthcare providers, and insurance companies can refuse to provide care for transgender people. I cannot stress enough how dangerous this is, and for a superpower country such as the USA to do something like this sets a deadly precedent worldwide. Also this month, the Polish president has made a pledge to defend children from LGBT ideology. A survey just last year in Poland named the LGBT movement and gender ideology as the biggest threat to the country through the eyes of men under 40. This is something that so many people worldwide still believe, so whilst equality is better, it's closer, we still have a long, long way to go. My plan for Pride Month this year was actually to spend a whole month focusing on LGBTQ plus true crime and history cases, but with the Black Lives Matter movement and specific sponsorships meant I had to change my plans, but there is definitely something I'm going to do next year for sure. But to make up for it, I'm just going to link all the videos I've done on my channel that focus on the LGBT community down below. Go and watch them if you haven't already and want to learn some things. And this is going to be sort of a mini Pride week. I've got a history video and this video, they're both Pride based. The community has such a wonderful, heartbreaking, rich history and there's so much to learn and so many things that people don't know and don't realise. So the crimes we're going to talk about today were committed by David Copeland, a neo-Nazi militant and member of far-right political groups, the British National Party and the National Socialist Movement. His crimes were committed in hatred, but it wasn't only hatred of the LGBTQ plus community that pushed him to kill, it was hatred of all minorities, anyone who wasn't a straight white man. It began two weeks earlier, on Saturday 17th of April 1999. It was just before 5.30pm at a crowded market in Brixton, South London, when a blonde man in a red jacket left a blue sports bag lying on the floor outside an Iceland supermarket, next to the bus stop on the corner of Electric Avenue. At 5.26pm, the bomb in the bag explodes. There was no warning, no reason for anyone to think they were about to come the victims of a terrorist attack. But people were immediately concerned when this strange guy placed down this bag in the middle of the street. Whilst everyone was working out what to do with this very strange bag, one 15 year old boy simply picked up the bag and moved it to a safe area closer to the wall. He didn't look inside the bag but just acted on instinct. In doing so, it slightly saved many lives. One article I read in The Guardian stated that the bomb was actually taken out of the bag by somebody else and put on a stack of wooden pallets at the side of the shop. The CCTV pictures of the scene showed that the bomb was clearly visible and the security guard from the store from Iceland was desperately trying to usher people, the public, away from it but nobody was taking him seriously. Why would they believe him that a bomb's about to go off? The bomb exploded just seconds after it was placed by the side of the shop. It was a nail bomb and upon explosion, thousands of nails were blasted in every direction, embedding themselves in the bodies of passerbys. 48 people were injured in the bombing. This was a Saturday evening in a busy area. There were many people, many families out doing their weekly shop at the market or just having a browse. One of the victims was a 23 month old boy who was left with a nail lodged in his skull. Luckily though, no one was fatally injured and everyone managed to survive the attack. The young boy underwent surgery and had the nail removed. I'm unsure if he had further complications throughout his life because of this. The injuries varied from major to minor. Some had superficial injuries caused by the glass windows being shattered. Some had nails embedded in their skin. One girl had a nail embedded in her cheek, whilst another man was lying in the street with severe head, chest and leg injuries. One man had a nail pierced his lung. It was a miracle that no one died. 
It seems that police officers had already been called to the scene upon the discovery of the bomb and they were actually walking towards the device as it went off, so response was pretty quick. It later transpired that Brixton was not a random choice for the location of this attack. Brixton's well known for being a multiracial area. It was a scene of many race riots and protests back in the 80s. For this reason, it was believed by the police pretty early on that this was going to be a racial attack, possibly right-wing extremists lashing out against the recent Stephen Lawrence report. Many people believed it to be the work of the IRA, much of the public, but the police ruled this out pretty quickly, emphasising that it was not related to Irish terrorism. According to The Guardian, four different racist groups claimed responsibility for this bombing pretty soon after. I don't think people really expected there to be a second bombing so soon, except for the people of Brick Lane. There had been rumours flying around all week, phone calls and letters to locals warning, you are next, or so rumour has it anyway. The locals all seemed to suspect it would either be them or Southall targeted next. Brick Lane was the centre of one of London's biggest Bangladeshi communities and home to another very popular market. The perpetrator thought that the Brick Lane market was also on a Saturday, same as Brixton, but in a stroke of luck, it just happened to be on a Sunday. Brick Lane was also one of the fastest growing tourist areas of London. A lot of people tended to visit the market. So again, around 5.30pm the following Saturday, a black Reebok bag was left on the pavement in Hanbury Street, about 30 yards away from the junction of Brick Lane. Once again, it's a busy area, people and their families out doing their weekly shopping, making the most of the weekend. It's just lucky that the market wasn't on that day. About 5.45pm, a man spots this bag and picks it up, walking with it to the nearby Brick Lane police station, only to find it shut. Not sure what to do, this man decides to put the bag in his car whilst he walks away to call the police. And it was at this point in the car that the bomb exploded, destroying the car in the process. It lifted the entire vehicle up into the air and blew the roof 25 yards away. The car next to it was set alight. Due to the brave actions and quick thinking of this man who picked up this bag from the street knowing that it could have been a bomb, only six people were injured, all Bangladeshis. Although none of them were seriously injured, they were all treated at the local hospital and sent home with relatively superficial injuries. The residents of Brick Lane were mad. They felt like the police hadn't taken their concerns seriously beforehand. They thought that they were going to be the next target. And the police at this one were the last emergency services to arrive on scene. After this, racial minority communities across London began to live in fear. Would it be their area attacked the following Sunday? A second bombing entirely changed the course of the police investigation, who now knew they had a serial bomber on their hands. One bomb was indicative of one bomb. Two bombs were indicative of more to come. The police assumed there would be another one the following week, so it was just a race against time to apprehend the perpetrator before they could strike again, and this time, they could possibly kill. The police couldn't just work under the assumption that it would be the following Saturday though, following this pattern. The bomber would likely change their pattern now to throw them off, make themselves less predictable. Across London, people debated who was responsible. Was it a lone wolf or indeed one of the racist groups that had claimed the attacks already? Where would the next attack be? People began to pay very close attention to unattended bags across the city and there was a sense of having each other's backs, helping out your neighbours, which for anyone who knows London at all knows that this is generally more of a don't make eye contact and don't talk to me kind of city. Even in London, people come together in times of strife. So where do the police start an investigation like this? As with a lot of cases, finding a perpetrator is a little like finding a needle in a haystack. How do you find one person in a city of 7 million? Through CCTV, of course. They begin the painstaking job of ploughing through miles and miles of tape, a 24-7 job, literally. And this was 1999, it wasn't just footage backed up into a hard drive, it was all actual videotapes they had to put into a player, watch and take out again. The police were looking for anyone on these tapes that were holding bags that matched the holders close to the crime scenes, close to the time the bombs went off. After the Brick Lane bombings as well, the second bombings, it was clearer than ever to the police that their initial thoughts this was a racist attack were probably correct. After countless hours of trawling through the CCTV footage, they finally pinpoint the guy they think they're looking for. They had his face, but they still didn't have his name, so the authorities make a decision. They put his photo out in the media, asking anyone with information on his identity to come forward and let them know who he is. 
but it was a risky move. It meant there was a good chance this man, whoever he is, might move his next attack forward and get it done before he's inevitably caught. Most people in London were now under the impression that these attacks were purely racial. Most were expecting the next attack to either be in Southall, which is the home to London's largest Sikh community and has a general South Asian culture, or potentially the Jewish Golders Green. But what if the bomber changed tact and struck the gay community? The police had the same thought, issuing a half-hearted warning to the gay community of Soho, where most gay bars in London were and are located. Some bars in Soho put up warnings to customers to be vigilant, but not many people took it seriously. The general consensus was that it was all purely racial. Even Julie Waterson, the head of the Anti-Nazi League, said, I've never met a Nazi who's gay friendly, but I really think that being racist is at the top of their agenda right now. So any fears the LGBTQ plus community had were pretty much dismissed. But then on Friday the 30th of April 1999, the third and final bomb was planted at the Admiral Duncan pub on Old Compton Street in Soho, the very heart of London's gay community and one of the city's oldest gay pubs. It was the beginning of the bank holiday weekend, the pubs and the street outside were crowded with people having a drink to celebrate. A man walks into the bar and places yet another black holder on the floor, in between the feet of patrons. This was about 5.30pm. The man placed down the bag and started to chat to one of the customers, pretending to be waiting for a friend. He then leaves the bar at 6.05pm, leaving the bag on the floor. Despite how busy it was, it didn't take long for people to notice the unattended bag and start to move away. People were obviously on high alert. At 6.37pm, the pub manager Mark Taylor bent over the bag to investigate, when the bomb filled with fertiliser and hundreds of nails went off in his face. The bomb ripped through the building and the room filled with dust. The bomber had perfected his technique, it seemed, realising that much more damage could be done by placing a bomb inside a building. There's a newspaper article written by Jonathan Cash, who was a survivor of the incident, in which he wrote, It was the loudest, most alien noise I've ever heard. It ripped through the building. I really can't say how long it lasted, a few seconds perhaps. I can't remember, but there was a crunch of something solid, something structural. But what I can remember is the acrid smell, the sulfurous dust. My ears were ringing, my eyes were smarting, the dust filled my nose, making it hard to breathe. I could see very little in front of me, perhaps five or six inches. Jonathan himself said the explosion blew a hole in his shoulder, that he lost a chunk of his thumb and had his hair burn off in places. But he was one of the lucky ones. Dozens were injured, some regarding amputations and skin grafts. 79 were injured in total, and sadly this time, three people died. Nick Moore and John Light had brought along their four-month pregnant friend, Andrea Dykes, and her husband, Julian, to the Admiral Duncan for a drink, on their way to see Mamma Mia in the West End in celebration of Andrea's pregnancy. It was meant to be a really exciting night for all of them. Nick, John and Andrea all sadly died and Julian was less seriously injured in a coma for weeks. By the time the bomb went off at the Admiral Duncan, the police were already on the trail of the perpetrator. A man called Paul Mifsud had called the police to say that he recognised his colleague, David Copeland, as the Brixton bomber, the moniker being used for him in the papers. Copeland was an engineer's assistant working on the Jubilee line. And in fact, Paul had called the police just one hour and 20 minutes before the bombing had taken place, but the police just couldn't track him down quick enough. It wasn't long after Copeland arrived back at his home in Hampshire that the police descended down on him, at which point he immediately admitted responsibility to the arresting officers. In his bedroom, the officers found two swastika flags hung up on the wall, bomb making equipment and a membership card to a far right group, the National Socialist Movement. Also on the walls, the police found newspaper clippings and photographs of the people who had been injured in the previous bombings in Brixton and Brick Lane, trophies of sorts of the pain he'd caused. Copeland told the police that he was a Nazi who believed in a white master race. According to the prosecutor at the later trial, Nigel Sweeney, he did not like black people or Asian people and wanted them out of the country. He thought that the British people had a right to ethnic cleansing like the Serbs. He thought the bomb would be the spark to start a fire in this country, stirring up a racial war that would cause white people to vote for the British National Party. Despite the previous comments from the head of the Anti-Nazi League, it did seem like Copeland had an even bigger hatred of gays though than he did of other races. He said that gay men were perverted degenerates that should be put to death, 
and that he would prefer the company of a black or Asian man rather than a gay man. He hated gay men and apparently his hatred stemmed from the way his parents treated him as a child. It seems that this may have stemmed from Copeland having concerns that he was gay himself. Apparently when his parents sang along to the Flintstones theme tune on TV, We'll Have a Gay Old Time, he believed they were sending him a message. He thought his parents were trying to make him to be gay. I couldn't find any information on whether he was actually gay or not, but this was a big concern of his, it seems. This was a hatred he had from an early age. At trial, it was determined that Southall would indeed have been his next target had he not been caught. He had no intention of giving up. He planned to keep bombing until he was caught. He'd been planning the campaign for several months, coming up with the idea when a bomb went off in Centennial Park during the Olympic Games in Atlanta in 1996. He had fantasies about blowing up the Notting Hill Carnival and his thoughts manifested until he decided to act upon them in April 1997, when he downloaded a manual called the Terrorist Handbook at Cyber Cafe in Victoria. He said that he wanted to make proper bombs, but it was difficult to make the chemical ingredients needed and so he gave up. It wasn't until a night in 1998 when he was bored and looked at the manual again and saw the instructions on how to make a pipe bomb. Much less sophisticated, he thought it would be easier to make and I suppose, sadly, he was right. He set about collecting the materials for pipe bombs, buying £1,500 worth of fireworks and old-fashioned alarm clocks to use as his timers. He packed 1,500 nails in each device and then taped them into sports holders. He would experiment with different mixtures of flash powder to determine how to get the biggest explosion, literally just spending months and months blowing things up in his bedsit. On the 17th of April, he takes one of the holders with him and heads to Brixton, which he believed to be the heart of London's black community. Copeland later told detectives that he was surprised to see so many white people there as well, but he resented them for choosing to live in a black area, so he didn't care about hurting them either. A week later, he headed to Brick Lane, expecting to find the busy market in full swing, but discovered that he was a day early. I'm assuming that as he'd already set the timer on the bomb, there was little he could do about his mistake, so he sets it down anyway. The actions of the brave man putting the suspicious holder in his car potentially saved lives, a car taking the brunt of the impact. He had then planned to strike again the following Saturday, but as I said, he was forced to move his plans forward when he heard on the radio that the police had released CCTV footage of him in Brixton. After hearing this on the radio, he goes home to Hampshire and was surprised to find the police still hadn't found him yet. So he just collects his bomb making materials and heads to London, where he checks into a hotel in Victoria under a false name on the 29th of April, the day before. The next morning, he assembled the bomb and set it to go off at 6.30pm, his final crime. Over the course of three weeks, he injured 149 people in total and killed three. Everything he did was born out of hatred, out of this far-right ideology. David Copeland stressed to the police that he'd acted entirely on his own and he told nobody else of his plans. He dismissed the other racist groups who claimed the crimes. He said they were just trying to take his glory. Because of course, he never regretted his crimes for even a second. He was as proud as ever. Soon after his arrest, Copeland's mental state was assessed at Broadmoor Hospital. He was diagnosed as having paranoid schizophrenia, telling psychiatrists that he'd started having sadistic dreams from the age of 12. He couldn't get a proper job after finishing school in 92 and he blamed immigrants for this. He was proven to have a higher than average IQ and his parents said that he was relatively normal up until the age of 19 when he started isolating himself. There was no argument that this was definitely a very mentally ill man, but the question was whether this was the cause of his crimes. To what point was he able to take responsibility for his own actions? He seemed to be very sure of what crimes he'd committed and why he'd done them. He was lucid and determined to get his point across at every opportunity. Did he commit his crimes because of his schizophrenia or just because he was a racist, homophobic neo-Nazi? Throughout the trial, they heard from six defence psychiatrists and Dr Philip Joseph for the prosecution. The Crown Prosecution Service refused to accept his plea of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility through schizophrenia. The jury decided that he knew exactly what he was doing when he decided to make those bombs. It was nothing to do with his mental state. On the 30th of June 2000, he was convicted of three counts of murder and planting bombs, given six concurrent life sentences, and the judge said how he doubted that he would ever be safe to release. He was to begin his sentence at Broadmoor Hospital to be treated for his psychotic illness, on the condition that if and when his condition improved, he would be transferred to prison, where the time he serves would be decided by the Home Secretary on the recommendations of the judge. In March 2007, it was decided that he would stay in prison for at least 50 years and he would serve longer if it was necessary for the protection of the public. 
If he is ever released, he will remain on license for the rest of his life and may be recalled to prison at any time. This means that he won't be released until 2049 at the earliest, at which point to be 73 years old and will have been in prison since he was 22. Copeland did appeal his sentencing, but in 2011, the Court of Appeal upheld the ruling. The scary thing about cases like this, about people like David Copeland, is how many there are lurking in the shadows. Most would not commit a crime to this severity, but some would do. And it's all based on hatred and misunderstanding and a lack of education. These right-wing groups that claim the attacks as their own, even though they didn't do them, are still very much up and running today. They haven't just disappeared. And if what we've been seeing lately in the media with the racist counter-protests that have popped up all across the UK, they're only growing in strength. That is terrifying to me. In life, you surround yourself with people who have similar ideologies and similar morals to you. That's how you connect with people, it's how you make friends. And so I go on Twitter and everyone thinks the same as me and it's lovely and it's like all my friends, we have conversations and we all agree on these things. And it's terrifying to me that there are people out there who don't have the same thoughts and opinions. There are people out there who are racist and homophobic and just filled with these horrible thoughts about people who are different from them. It's such a mindset that I will never ever be able to understand. In the article written by Jonathan Cash, the man who survived the Admiral Duncan bombing, he says that after the attack he was stumbling along Old Compton Street for help. A girl pushed him out of the way so she could go and get a look at what she called the puffs. It's accepting this kind of ignorance that leads to deeper hatred, which is why I urge you to always call out people for their unkindness if it's safe for you to do so. A lot of people just speak out of ignorance or lack of education, not realising the power behind their words and actions. But left unchecked on a very rare occasion, it leads to things like this, like the Admiral Duncan bombings or the arson attack at the upstairs lounge in New York or the Pulse nightclub shootings. Maybe education, somebody calling them out on their words and thoughts from a young age might have made a difference to the perpetrators. Maybe not, of course, but all we can do is try. Be an ally when you can for the LGBTQ plus community, for the black community, all people of colour, all marginalised groups. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.